Over the last few weeks, we, we've been contemplating, we've been thinking about the vision of the church, where the church is going, what the church is all about. And uh, I wonder if we could just call up those slides from a couple of weeks ago, very, very quickly. I just want to refer to one or two of them. Now, we spoke about the vision. Um, we we kind of use a strap line, hear the vision, see the vision, be the vision. We talked about who we are and what we want to do. And we also talk, talked about, oh, I've got the clicker, yeah, sorry. You can go ahead of me if, I, if I'm slow. So it's the, it's the presentation of the PowerPoint slides from the Vision Day. We had them last week set to, to run for, for last week. But we, we spoke about the, the mission of the church. We spoke about the purpose of the church. We spoke about the vision of the church. And if you remember, the, 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 our mission is equipping and empowering people to communicate and to apply the love of God and the gospel of Christ. There is no gospel without love. There is no gospel without love. And, and love means, you know, um, tolerance, forgiveness, patience with people, suffering long with people and still sticking by them, uh, being able to forgive, having the ability to forgive, having the ability not to hold grudges against one another. Uh, when we talk about the love of Christ, that's what we're talking about. And in order for us to demonstrate the love of Christ, we have to demonstrate character, Christ-like character, God-like character. We need to understand that although in the natural, when we're loving people, we lose it may seem like we lose initially, but actually if you stick with it, you'll gain. Because, you know, uh, sometimes you feel you've lost because you've, you've had to give up your rights and allow the other person to have the upper hand. But God says, all right, all right, I see you. I see what you're doing. You gave them the upper hand there. You didn't need to do that. It's costing you. You know what I'll do? I'll compensate you. I'll give you a double portion over there. You may feel you've lost over there, but over here, I'm going to give you a double portion. And so it pays to love. It pays to live like Jesus and it pays to love. It pays to suffer, to bleed and to die on a cross. But God will reward. Amen? Sometimes we're being told off. Sometimes my wife tells me off. I don't like it. But then I know she's, she's right, actually. She's right. You know, what she's saying is right. So I, I, I really don't like it. But I, it's good for me. It's good to be corrected. It's good to... You know, sometimes my kids pull me up, you know, dad, the thing about you, dad, is, you know, I say, mm, 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 mm. but there's a little kernel of truth in that that I need to pay attention to. Amen. So we all need to learn to be, uh, to be in a position where we can be corrected, where we can be pulled up, where we can be criticized, that we can still love and get over the circumstances and get over the people. Amen. And we need to be like that. And so our mission is to love people, uh, to love ourselves in the appropriate way to love people, first and foremost to love God. Our purpose is to fulfill the mandate given to us to go and make disciples of all nations. See, if all we do is just have a, a, a nice jolly in church like we had today, and yeah, we're worshiping God, but we're also having a good time. We're, you know, we're rejoicing. The children, of the, the children of Israel rejoiced before the Lord and danced. They played timbrels and they blew trumpets and they danced before the Lord and they worshiped the Lord. Amen. David assembled a mass choir of instruments and musicians. And, and he said, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lads. And he, and he said, you know, uh, Psalm 150, come before the Lord and play, praise him on the cymbals and praise him, praise him on the loud sounding drums and praise him on the harp and so on. And we should praise God in all those ways. But our purpose is to equip and empower people to make disciples. Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And we spoke about our vision. Our vision is to be a vibrant, diverse, multi-generational church family that is continuously growing. That means that 
as we live in a multicultural, multiracial, multi-ethnic uh, city, country, then our congregation needs to reflect where we live and who we are. And so we're calling all nations, we're calling all creeds, we're calling all colors, we're calling all backgrounds. I think we did a little survey once as to what is the racial or what is the uh, national demographics of our congregation. I think we came to, with over 30 different nationalities in the congregation. That was, that was Legacy Micah. So now with, with Heartbeat as well, I don't know, we're, but it's probably over 30 different nationalities and nations in this congregation. You might all look similar, but you're all very different. Amen? And you'll, you will have different backgrounds and different cultures and different languages and, and so on. And so that's our, our, our mission, our purpose, our vision uh, to reach people and so on. Now, I just want to share briefly what uh, you don't need to worry about looking for that uh, presentation any, any further because I'm going to move on from there just to say um, that um, we, we did give a breakdown, didn't we, of what it means to be vibrant, what it means to be diverse, what it means to be multi-generational, what it means to be a church family. I won't go into more details on that. And of course, you can also check that out on the church website, micah.org.uk. You can go there and find out more about what God is saying. But I do want to just summarize this scripture that God gave me to share today before we close. And I came up with this title, or I think the Holy Spirit uh, reminded me and gave me the title, We Are One Family. We Are One Family. We Are One Family. And for that, we're going to turn in our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We'll probably get it on the screen as well. Chapter 12, I'm reading from verse, verse 12. And there are seven or eight quick points that I want us to look at here that Paul is saying. He's saying that we are a body. The church, the members of the church are a body. We are like a living organism. That's what a body is. A body is something that is alive, something that is functioning, something that is tangible, something that can respond, something that is moving, living, breathing, and it has a purpose. And he says here that in verse 12, the human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. If you dismember members of the body, they, they have no use. If you dismember your hands or if you dismember your feet, if you dismember an arm, it dies. It dies on its own. There's an analogy there. When you hear people saying, I'm done with church. I'm finished with church. You going back to church now that the, the, uh, the uh, COVID thing's over? Nah, nah, nah. I'm not going back to church. I think I'm, I think I'm past it. Uh, what that is, is an amputation. A member of the body that's been uh, severed from the body and it will die on its own. We need each other. Okay, and so Paul is saying that as the human body has many parts, uh, but that all those parts make up one single body, and that, and that soldier now is moving, that all the body, all the parts are moving in unity, he's saying in, 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 in the next verse, uh, 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 12b and 13, he's saying, so it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some of us are Gentiles, some are slaves or servants, some are free. But we all have been baptized into one body by one spirit and we all share the same spirit. What he's saying there is it doesn't matter what your nationality is, it doesn't matter what your skin color is, it doesn't matter what the shade of your skin is, it doesn't matter what your age is, it doesn't matter what your financial status is, whether you're a rich person, a poor person, a middle class, a working class, whether you're a labor right or a conservative or a lib dem or anything else. Every single one of us are members of the same body, the body of Jesus Christ. We are all unified, we are all one, amen? And so when I look at you, I don't see your color first, when you look at me, you don't see my color first. Well, we're not color blind. Of course, I acknowledge your skin color. You acknowledge my skin color. However, that's not the most significant thing I see when I see you. Yeah, when I see you, the most significant thing that I see is my brother, my sister, because we are one, amen? One of the things I had to train my mind to do as a young man uh, was 
and even as an older man, was to see women as my sisters. I had to train my mind to do that because so many adverts on TV training my mind to see women as something else, to see women as objects, to see women uh, as, as uh, objects of gratification. But I had to train my mind, no, 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 no. Yeah, she is beautiful. Yeah, she's, she, she's got a great figure. Actually, she's my sister. I had to train my mind to do that. She's my sister. The older women who were strangers to me, I trained my mind, she's my mother. Gonna respect her like my mother. The older men are my, my, my fathers. The younger men are my brothers. The younger boys are my, my sons, okay? And so we have to train our minds so that we understand who everyone is and we treat everyone appropriately, amen? And then he goes on to say, uh, the third point, he says, yes, the body has many different parts, not just one part, but each part belongs to the whole body. Now, you may have thought that you're an individual, that you've got your own liberties and your own rights and you can do what you want and you can come and go when you like and you'll join the team when you want to join the team and you'll leave the team when you want to leave the team and I'm not serving today because I don't feel like it. You may have thought that that's how it goes. It doesn't go like that in church. In the body of Christ, it's different. Hear what, hear what the Bible says. The third point, he says, yes, the body has different parts, not just one part, but if the foot says... I'm not a part of the body. I'm done with that. Or well, bun that, as they say on the street. I'm not a part of the body. Because, uh, and then he goes on to say, uh, sorry, if the foot says, I'm not a part of the body because I am not the hand, does that make it any less a part of the body? And if the ear says, I'm not a part of the body because I'm not the eye, would that make it any less a part of the body? Of course not. And if the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? Or if your whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? So it's no point in looking at someone else and saying, you know what, I really want to be like that person. I really want to, I really want to be that person. Ah, oh, why do they get to do that and I have to do this? Because you were given the ability to serve this or serve there. Service is done, everyone's gone, the floor needs sweeping, there's a broom, it doesn't matter that you're the pastor, grab the broom and sweep the floor. You've all been given the ability to do what you've been given ability to do, so just do what you've been given the ability to do. And that's why in church, in the workplace, this works in a workplace too, you just do what needs to be done. This is, a, this is a quick lesson on how to get promoted. Turn up early, stay a little la later, uh, uh, be, you know, uh, be polite, don't fall out with people, and, and, and do more than is expected, and do your job diligently. So few people are doing that, you will end up at the front of the queue so quick, you can't believe it. Then they will start thinking about promoting you. Then they'll start thinking, this person's too valuable. We, we can't afford to lose this person. How do we keep this person in post? Well, we, make, we give them better benefits. We give them more salary. We, we treat them nicer. And I wonder if Jesus sees it like that when he sees members of the body functioning as they ought to. I wonder if he gives you more. Scripture teaches it. It says that if we use our gifts, then he gives us more gifts and more ability. But if we don't use our gifts, then he doesn't give us any more. Some of you can sing, but you don't want to sing. But if you start singing, God will give you more singing ability. Some of you can speak or prophesy. And if you speak or prophesy, God will give you more confidence. Pastors and leaders will give you more space and you'll be able to prophesy. Some of you can pray or lead a prayer meeting or whatever it is that you can do. It doesn't matter what your job is. You have a role to play in church. Look at all these budding actors we got in church. Me and Kareem were talking the other day, a couple of days, yesterday. Kareem started to laugh. I said, why, what's up? He said, man, some of these guys in church, they're now turned professional actors. He said, they're really good. They've become like professional actors. Why? They, did, they probably didn't even know they had that gift until they decided to, to act in the, in the uh, church play. And then all of a sudden they realized that they had the ability, a supernatural enablement came on them. And all of a sudden they had the ability. Do you know that when God was building the temple, he gave all of the artisans, all of the, all of the craftsmen, he gave them a supernatural enablement to do what they're doing. 
God can give you a supernatural enablement to make money. He can give you a supernatural enablement to run business. I see people all the time and I think, man, their administrative gift is off the chain. God has given them a supernatural ability to run administration. They're tremendously gifted in that area. Or God has given someone a, tremend a supernatural enablement to lead. You know, when I was at school, some of you should go to the ADHD uh, class and just learn what it is, what ADHD is, ADHD is and all those things, and then you might understand your past a bit better, okay? Now, I've never been tested. I've never been tested for anything. Uh, because if they say to me, oh, you've got dyslexia, or you've got uh, ADHD, or you've got, I'm like, it doesn't matter. That's never gonna stop me from doing anything. Or they say to me, oh, you don't you know about racism? Racism ain't gonna stop me. Racism might stop them, but it won't stop me. I do not see boundaries and barriers. I just go through them. And God does not see boundaries or barriers. He can make the tail the head. So, you know, so I've probably got a bit of ADHD. They, they, my wife tells me I do. Uh, <laughs> other people tell me I do. Uh, I, I probably have got a little touch. You know, everyone's got a little touch of something, right? Uh, but I see it as a gift. I see it as an incredible gift that enables me to do stuff that other people won't do. I, I'm, really, I'm really terrified. I'm really, I'm really caught for words. I'm really, you know, I'm always enthusiastic. I'm always up for it, you know? Uh, you know, so whatever it is I've got, God is using it. And, and whatever it is that you've got, God is using it. My wife is an introvert. But I tell you what, I wouldn't want to be married to anyone else. And I wouldn't want my wife to be an extrovert like me. We'd probably kill each other. Right, but with her introverted personality, she gets things done that I won't even touch. I won't even look at. I just say, Lorna, see you later, love. And it's sorted. Yeah, and, and detail that I won't look at, she'll look at. And so we complement each other. Amen? So your difference is important. And my difference is important because we need all of us. And you have gifts and abilities and professional skills that we want to use in the church found out recently that we got some, um, we got some, uh, well, we know we got educators in, 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 in here. We know that we've got uh, 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 accounting people in here. We know we've got financial advisors like Sam. Sam is a financial advisor. He, his company, they advise top doctors on how to prepare their pensions and how to, you know, Sam is there. If I have a question about my investments or uh, I want a second opinion about, I'll go to someone like Sam and, and Sam, Sam, give me a second opinion on this. What do you think? He knows all the laws. He knows all the he knows it, he knows it all. Uh, I, I understand recently we got a few people in here that know a little bit about keep fit and uh, and the physical exercise. And I'm, I'm planning to do like a whole month of health and wellness because you know one of my mentors, uh, Rick Warren from Purpose Driven, I consider him a mentor. I've learned a lot from him over the years. He, in his church, they will have a time where they will all weigh they all weigh they weigh themselves. And collectively as a congregation, they all try to lose weight over that period of time. And it works. And they're all working together trying to lose weight. And so, you know, I want to get us all in tracksuits and shorts and t-shirts for a few weeks. And we're in here and we're learning about how to make the body work. And we understand, you know, we need to know about body, mind and spirit. It's too many saints going to heaven prematurely because they're not healthy. And our bodies are the temple of the living God. And so our bodies are very, very important. And so we need to understand what the body is, how the body works, how the body functions, how to keep it fit. And we need to keep ourselves fit so that we've got longevity to do what God's given us to do. So we're going to be looking at health and wellness in, not too, in the not too distant future, especially when, uh, when, when the weather warms up. God even gave me an idea. Maybe I shouldn't speak it, but God gives us ideas. He gives us ideas. God gives you, drops ideas in your spirit. If I wanted to, and God releases me to do it, and gives me the time and the people around me, do you know, I could have my own, I could have my own um, educational, um, well, what would I call it? My own educational discipline. Yeah, I wouldn't name it after me, but could you imagine the Dennis Wade School of Physical Fitness? <laughs> and everybody all over the world is signing up for it. And I've painted it and I own it. And the finances from all over the world is coming into me because I created it. God's given me an idea of how to do that, what to do. Uh, I'm not going to tell you too much more. 
But God gives each and every one of us an ability as an individual, and he wants us to use it. So it doesn't matter whether you're a PT trainer or an educator or an accountant or a mother and baby mentor or whatever it is that you are, uh, you should let us know what your skills are. You should let us know what your gifts are. And you should say, Pastor, what are you doing to use my gifts in the body? Because your gifts is part of everyday life that we live. And so your gifts can be used for God. And, and I'm just rounding you up now. I'm just calling you and saying, hey guys, let's start using those gifts. The fourth thing Paul says is that God puts each part of the body right where he wants it. That's something I've learned about leadership, okay? Uh, uh, leadership is not about where you want to serve. Leadership is about you serve where you're needed. When you serve where you're needed repeatedly, consistently, habitually, you develop skills. When I was at school, they used to say in every one of my reports, he talks too much, he's easily distracted. I was easily distracted. I would be in the school, in the lesson, and the bell would ring and I'd be like, oh, the lesson's finished, but I didn't even hear one minute of it. <laughs> I was transported to another world. And I was daydreaming about what I wanted to daydream about, what I wanted to School was, much of school was a waste of time for me because they weren't, accommod they weren't accommodating me. They were talking about Henry VIII and all his dead wives and I'm thinking, what do I, what do I care? Do you know what I mean? What do I care about Henry VIII and all his dead wives? Uh, I was dreaming about what I wanted to do and what I wanted to, do you know what I mean? When I get to bed at night, I dream that I could fly through the sky. You know, I could, I, I believe I could fly. I, I used to have dreams like that all the time. I could fly, I could walk, yeah? And I was fighting people, kung fu in them and stuff like that. But I think God was telling me that I could do anything. That's how I interpret it. I used to dream some strange dreams at night. I used to do some strange things. I used to have feelings of grandeur. I was going to do, you know, I was, I was like Muttley, you know? Do you remember the little character Muttley? He used to dream about what he was going to do and what he's going to be. And they used to say to me, uh, you know, he talks too much. He's easily distracted. But he is a born leader. Now, they didn't put me through, they, if they knew that, and if they had any sense, they should have put me on a course for leadership. Oh, no, no, no. We don't do that at school. So I had to learn, that it was naturally in me to lead. And what I found was that every single forum I went into, I became the leader. Even when I didn't even know nothing about the subject, I walk in, everyone's taught, and their teacher will say, right, you lot, have a discussion, and then come back, and then tell us what you've decided. Every single time, they would elect me to be the leader. If they didn't elect me, when I heard people talking foolishness, I'd say, that's foolishness. And I'd go up and I'd say, this is the da 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 And they'd say, yes, well done, Dennis. It was in me. God put that in me to lead. To lead. So wherever I go, I always end up the leader. I go into rooms and I say, I'm not saying nothing. I'm going to sit down here quiet. I'm doing this. And I'm doing this. And then I jump up and I say, this is foolishness. This, <laughs> And they say, you're the leader. Everywhere I go, God keeps opening doors for me. That leadership thing is on me. I know many of my family members have, have that gift and ability. Many of them have that, that gift. In. Many of our church members and our friends have that ability. Many of you have that ability to lead. You just not realize. And sometimes you get leaders in school become like, you know, playing up the playing around and wasting time and they become, you know, a bad influence. No, they're not a bad influence. They've got so much influence. You just don't know how to use it. You don't know how to train it. You don't know how to home it. You don't know what to do with it. Amen? So God has made every single member in the body and he puts it right where he wants it. It doesn't matter about qualifications. He, 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 he'll get you around that. Qualifications are important, but God will take you around another route and he'll give you the qualifications somewhere else because life, all of life is a university. All of life. Verse 18, he says, but our bodies have many parts and God has put each part just where he wants it. How strange a body would be if it only had one part. So each and every one of us is placed exactly where God wants us to be. And we are all different. Some of us are similar, but we're all different. We all got our own unique set of skills and abilities. The fifth thing he says is that each part of the body works for the benefit of the whole body. This is the fit that people don't understand. I understand this. My gift is not for me. My gift is for you. My abilities is not for me. My abilities is to serve you. The greatest uh, 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 
Accomplishment is in serving people. When you serve people, you get promoted. Try it. Just try it at work. Just go around and ask people, is there anything I can do to help you? I'll call the boss to me and say, boss, I just want you to know I really enjoy working here. And I just thought I would be a little more helpful. And I want you to know that if there's any special tasks, any special things that you need doing, even the dirty bits, you know, I'm up for it. Just call me, boss. I'll, I'll help you. Boss will be like, really? Wow. He might test you, try you. When he sees that you're doing that, he'll realize that person is destined for great things. Before you know it, you're promoted. Sixth thing he says, we're coming down. Some of the seemingly weaker parts of the body are the most important. Verse 22, he says, in fact, some parts of the body that seem weakest and least important are actually the most important. You know, uh, no, uh, and the most necessary. The most necessary, the most important. No one gets up in the morning and says, oh, I think I'll give my heart a massage. I, I, I think I'll just, um, I think I'll just clean up my spleen. People, most people don't even know what a spleen is. You don't have a spleen, your life's, that's a life altering circumstances. People don't think, oh, let me just wash my kidneys out. Do you know you can wash your kidneys out? But how many people think about washing their kidneys? Most people just go through life abusing the kidney and expect to live to be 120. If you don't understand how the kidneys work and what the kidneys need and what care the kidneys need, then you're not going to take care of the kidneys. Okay? So each part has its own special function, has its own special need. Each part is important. And even the bits that you don't see of the body, they're the most important. And so it is. I was thinking about that. I was thinking about the children. The children are, could be seen as the most weakest members of this body, but they are the most important because without children, without seeds, you have no future crop. So those parts of the body that seem the weakest are evidently the most important. The quiet, silent people that are not up front making loads of noise are some of the most important people. I know and understand how important my wife is in my life. Don't make as much noise as me. She don't run around blowing her trumpet like I do. But she's there doing her thing in the background. And I know how important it is to have someone in my life that has those giftings and those abilities. And so it is with the body of Christ. Some of our members may seem quiet. Some of our members may not do a lot publicly, but they're working away behind the scenes. No one's giving you credit. Don't worry. God sees what you're doing. Those members round the back are very, very important. Last, last two. In verse 23, it says, uh, and the parts we regard as less honorable are those we clothe with the greatest care. So we carefully protect those parts that should not be seen, while the most honorable parts do not require this special care. So God has put the body together such that extra honor and care are given to those parts that have less dignity. I think that's self-evident. Don't need to elaborate on that. Number seven, God wants and creates harmony in the body of Christ. Verse 25, he says, this makes, our, this makes for our harmony among the members so that all the members care for each other. That is just so important. This makes for harmony amongst the members so that all the members care for each other. If one part suffers, all the members suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all the parts are glad. This morning I was so overjoyed just watching Stella lead worship. And I was thinking, what a gift, what a leader, what ability, what talent, the anointing. Sorry, Stella, I'm going to embarrass you now. The prophetic, the prophetic gifting that Stella has as she leads, tremendous. And I was just there honoring that gift and just thanking the Lord for that gift. And weren't you blessed? Aren't you blessed every week? And not just Stella, all the team, all the team members, when they prophesy and when they speak, Claudette, uh, Raquel, 
Rachel, Lorna, all of them, and the musicians on the instruments. They're not up front. You don't hear them like you hear the vocalists, but they're behind there prophesying on those keys, prophesying with that drum, prophesying on that bass. They're doing something. Every single one of them is important, and they all work together like an orchestra. Amen? It's beautiful. It's wonderful. And then you've got some guys at the back. Very, very few people notice that they're there, but if they weren't doing what they're doing, the sound would be terrible. If they weren't doing what they're doing, there'd be no scripture behind us. Every single one of us doing our part. Some stewarding, some came to set the banners up outside and inside, some doing the hospitality afterwards. We need all of us. Last one, he says, verse 27, he says, all you, oh, did I give this? Um, Sorry, the last point he says is number eight. So we are all members of Christ's body and all have equal value to him. We are all members of Christ's body and all have equal value to him and to each other. This is the point. You keep hearing me bang on about, you know, we're not into titles. We're not into positions. We don't want to worship the pastors and the leaders. You know, we're all brothers and sisters. We're all you know, equal. We're all equal. Some have more authority in some areas, but we're all equal. We can all serve. And this is what I keep banging on about. In God's eyes, in Christ's eyes, we are all equal. You may feel that the evangelist is more important than the deacon and the apostle is more important than the pastor. God doesn't see it like that. He sees every single member of as equal importance. Isn't that wonderful? And so we should too. And so how we treat each other, how we speak to each other, how we behave with each other, has to be with that in mind. Verse 27, all of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is a part of it. So Paul summarizes the whole thing in verse 28. He says, here are some of the parts, some of the parts, here are some of the parts, God has appointed for the church. He says, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then those who do miracles, then those who have the gift of healing. How do you know that we've got people in here that have the gift of healing? How many of you know, we haven't yet started to see manifestation of healing in Sunday morning, but I assure you, we shall see people healed in the service. I know that me and my brothers used to sing, we used to go places, people used to get healed while we were doing concerts. People used to get healed in, in, in concerts. I believe that if I lay hands on the sick and pray for them, they shall be healed. But I don't do that until I feel unctioned to do it. And sometimes I don't feel unctioned to do it because I'm not in the position or place to do it. And the key is to always be in the position or the place where God can use you in that way. One of the big things about healing is you, you have to have compassion for the sick. When you have compassion for the sick, when you love people, it's easier for you to, for God to manifest miracles through you because first of all, Jesus was moved with compassion. And if you don't have compassion for people, you can't manifest certain gifts. So we, we need to love, I love strangers. I, 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 I don't know them from Adam yet. I love them. Why? Because I see people as most of the time I try, sometimes I struggle, sometimes I miss them up. But my natural default is to love people and to see the need in people. Then those who have gifts of healing, those who can help others. How many of you want that gift? The gift to help others. I want that gift. I possess that gift. If I hear there's somebody in need, I'm thinking, oh, what, they've got financial problems? They just need someone to sit down and go through their finances with them. They just need someone to show them how they can make a little extra money here, there. I just, we, we can help that person. Some have the gift of helps. They can help. They want to help. Those who have the gift of leadership. There it is. Some have the gift of leadership. It's a gift. Those who speak in unknown languages or tongues. 
Then he says, are we all apostles? Are we all prophets? Are we all teachers? Do we all have the power to do miracles? Do we all have the gift of healing? Do we all have the ability to speak in unknown languages? Do we all have the ability to interpret unknown languages, tongues? Of course not. So you should earnestly desire the most helpful gifts. Then he goes on to say something here that just makes, what, it, what, I want to be, I feel like I could be slain when I think about it. When he said all of that, he says, but now let me show you the best, well, let me show you a way of life that is best of all. A way of life that is best of all. There is a way of life that is best of all. And then he starts the next verse and he says, Though I speak with tongues of men and tongues of angels, if I do not have love, I am but a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. Let's say, what does he say next? He's showing us a lifestyle that is more excellent than all of these gifts, more excellent than leadership, more excellent than pastoring, more excellent than being an apostle. He's showing us how to live life successfully. And if I could speak all the languages of the earth, German, Russian, Italian, Chinese, Patwa, and of angels, but didn't love others, it would only be like a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. What's the next one say? Next verse. If I had the gifts of prophecy, and if I could understand all of God's secret plans, and possess all knowledge. My head is exploding with knowledge and insight. I've got qualifications coming out of my ears. And if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but I didn't have this lifestyle called love, I would be absolutely nothing. I wouldn't even be a pile of filth on the floor if I didn't have this. He's showing us a more excellent way. We're going to close in a minute. Please, what does he say next? This is the more excellent way. The most excellent, let, let me show you a more excellent way. If I give everything I have to the poor, I'm charitable, and even sacrifice my own body on a bonfire, I could boast about it. Oh, yeah, it was me. Look what I've done to my arm. I chopped it off. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. The only gain that you can possibly have is to love the unlovable. And that's why I say, let the prostitute come. Let the lesbian come. Let the gay come. Let the liar come. Let the adulterer come. Let Dennis come. Even Dennis, let him come. Let them all come. Because we've got to love them. And to love them means that we've got to find out what their needs are and we've got to try and meet their needs, no matter who they are or no matter where they come from. This is the spirit of Jesus. What, what else does he say? What else does he say? Love is patient. Have you ever been impatient? Love is patient. Love is kind. Have you ever been unkind? Have you ever been mean? Love is kind. Love is not jealous. Have you ever been jealous? It's not boastful, it's not proud, it's not arrogant. What else does it do? Love is not rude. It does not demand its own way. Yesterday I was driving along, I had, not far from me there's a row of shops. Guy parks up his car and he sits there, and he leaves the car and he goes into the shop and he goes to buy something. I didn't know that he left, left the car, so I pull up, I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, what's going on? The guy's not moving, he's just there. So I toot my horn in case somebody's in the car and they don't realize. And then the guy comes out of the shop and he, he makes some comment to me. I'm like, oh, oh, we, oh, who am I speak to? Oh, how oh, oh, weird. So I'm like, so I jumped out of my car, so I said, you what, mate? And he said some glib comment, like take a chill pill or something like that, you know. Um, what has he said? Some chill. I said to him, mate, what? He says, you're, you're two in your horn, you're two in your horn. So, you know, take a chill pill. I'm like, mate, you, you parked in the middle of the highway. I didn't know whether he was in the car or not. I took my horn just in case you didn't notice. And you're in a shop buying stuff and you just blocked, blocked the driveway. 
What are you doing, mate? Yeah, 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 yeah. Have a nice day. I said, I was having a nice day till I met you. And the Spirit of the Lord said to me, and I started to sing, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. I'm six foot two, the guy's like five foot five, and I'm thinking, mate, I could saw you out in a minute. The Spirit of the Lord said to me, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. It's not rude. It does not demand its own way. We will get tested on this stuff. It is not irritable. Anybody irritable? And it keeps no record of wrong. How many, you're keeping Psalms on all the wrongs people did you? You've written down lists, lists of, and that one did do me this, and that one, and wait till I get back to him, and I'm gonna show him, and I'm gonna teach them a lesson, and they're gonna know not to mess with me. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out, even if it's against me. That's why I train myself, I practice myself to say, I was wrong and you was right. You want to see the look on people's face, they're shocked. What? I said, I was wrong and you was right. <laughs> it's okay. I'm good about it. Love never gives up. Love never loses faith. It always it's always hopeful, it always endures through every circumstance, it's patient, it's long-suffering, it never gives up on you. What else does it say? Prophecy and speaking in, in unknown languages and special knowledge will come, uh, will become useless, but love will last forever. <laughs> we can stop there. All the prophesying, Passed on his gifts, soon done. Singing in the choir and in the worship team, soon done. Wonderful teaching, which is soon done. All of that is going to be done with. All your money, all your business, your house, your land, it's all going to be done. The only thing that's going to be left that we can take to eternity is love. Let's bow our heads, shall we? Let's ask God to give us more love. Thank you for listening to the message today. We hope it blessed you. And if it did, please like, comment and subscribe for more videos from Micah. And don't forget to click the notification bell to see when they're uploaded. Thank you for joining us today. We'll see you in the next one.